moving from whitetails to wapiti. For a lot of white-tailed deer hunters out there that have never done it, a first-time elk hunt is something that, man, you just so want to experience. And there are a whole bunch of guys and gals headed west out there this year to do just that. So many of our letters are now from first-timers wanting to learn about the jump from deer to elk hunting. And y'all, I feel you. I've been there and done that. And we totally understand. We know a lot of you are overwhelmed with all of the unknowns and so, so many questions. But trust me, it's nothing that a few visits to our old elk camp just can't fix. So in this week's episode, we're going to help you with ways to change that stress into, well, let's say a whole new adventure. So my friends, pull up a chair, adjust your volumes just right, and welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting, brought to you by ElkGrows.com, with your host Gilbert Arnellis and elk hunting coach Joe Gillian. You want to hunt elk? And they live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons, doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Hello again, everyone. If it's your first time with us, glad to have you. Hope you enjoy our show. And for those blue collar hunters following our show, welcome back to Elk Camp. I'm Gilbert Ornelas coming to you from the big town of Spring, Texas. And joining me from Cimarron, New Mexico, your elk hunting coaches, Joe Gillia and Leroy Chav Chavez. Yeah, we got hey, Chav back tonight, man. That's right. <laughs> Chav, you on the mend, brother. How you feeling? I'm feeling a lot better. Had a little bout with bronchitis, and that kind of slowed me down, but I'm back on the horse. Well, that's awesome, Chav, for real. Uh, well, Joe, Chav, y'all know what it's time. It's time for our Elk Bros shout-outs. <laughs> if you're new to the show, these shout-outs are just a few cities that are the most listeners that are topping our charts. Yes, sir. And before we get into this week's top listeners, I like to do this every now and then because we always talk about that week's listeners, and it's so cool. I mean, boy, yeah, uh, when our last podcast came out, people were just hammering it and, and soaking it in, and that really makes you feel good. But at the same time, we've got all of those big, consistent uh, towns and cities that have been over the long haul really putting the time in so I want to once again thank those cities that have been our top five listening base over the long haul for the last 10 episodes so a huge thanks to all our grinders in Big H Houston Minneapolis H-town in the house yeah <laughs> Denver Albuquerque yeah. and Portland, Oregon, man. Those have been the top five in the last 10. And uh, we so appreciate all those listeners from those big cities that are just uh, checking us out and, <clears throat> and learning right along with us and everybody else. That's awesome, Joe. Well, topping our charts this week, I, it's a city that I know dearly. It was there last week. Uh, <laughs> the frozen margarita machine and the circuit computer chip was invented here. And uh, for those of y'all don't know, their multiple Super Bowl championship football team first debuted as the Steers and not the Cowboys. Oh, That's sure. the big home of Dallas, Texas. Big D. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, buddy. <laughs> Way to go. Yes, sir. Well, Thanks, Dallas. This city originally dubbed the Glass City because it led to the Glass Industries production as well as being the location of the first company to produce glass sheets or sheet glass is Jeanette, Pennsylvania. You got a sister name or no, you got a, 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 niece, a niece named a Jeanette. Niece, Jeanette. Jeanette, right. Yeah. Jeanette, Pennsylvania. Well, that's awesome, man. This city's name is found nowhere else in the world. And that's a pretty good one you found here, Joe. Yeah, yeah. So combined from the names of two railroad tycoons, Mm -hmm. J.W. Paramore and J. Gould. So, Paragould, Arkansas is in the house tonight. Paragould, Arkansas. You know, those guys actually had a little battle because they were major competitors and tycoons, and there was a little anger over 
whose part of the name came last in the name. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's awesome, yeah, man. that didn't go well. So up next, nicknamed the River City. So listen to this, guys. It is said that because of a curse that was set by the Utes during their exodus when they were forced out to Utah, that no person born in the valley of this town may leave permanently unless a small amount of sand is collected and kept from the junction of the rivers. Grand Junction, Colorado. That's, that's awesome, man. <laughs> yeah. How'd you and find you, that, Joey? Well, <laughs> dude, I mean, they're the listeners. I go and look wow. for stuff on, on each of these towns, and that's I saw awesome. that, and I was like, and I and I looked up the Ute curse, and there was so much on that that there's a lot of people said, "Oh, you don't have to worry about it," but I think I'll keep some sand just in case. <laughs> <laughs> Grand Junction, so, Colorado, man, I've been there many days chasing oil field equipment. Well, so that everybody knows too, uh, Grand Junction was named after the river. It used to be the Grand River and was later named the Colorado because they didn't want it to be confused with the Rio Grande. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, pretty cool stuff. I, I learned Very something cool. new every day. Interesting. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, 40 miles up the road, once the home of Kit Carson, the original Pueblo here at 1,000 years old and is still standing and in use, which makes it the oldest inhabited community in America. Uh, our neighbors, like I said, 40 miles away from Cimarron, uh, a big shout out to Taos, New Mexico. Taos in the house, man. Taos in the house. Neat yeah. town Taos is. I um, love sure. seeing those New Mexico names pop up there in, in, the, in the top listeners. You bet. Guys, if you'd like what we're doing, please subscribe, rate, and review. You have to go to Apple Podcast or iTunes to review, and you can check out more elk hunting content at elkbros.com. And just a reminder, if any of our listeners would like their questions answered on our show, just send your questions to info at elkbros.com. And info send them in, man. Our whole program last week was an awesome program, and it was completely based on viewers' questions. And, in fact, that inspired what we're doing now tonight. So Absolutely. All right, boys, well, let's dive in. You know, the focus for this for uh, those whitetail hunters wanting to try elk hunting, Joe, but this this applies to pretty much all deer hunters and even turkey hunters as well. Oh, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, when we talked about deer hunters and the reason that came up is, again, in our letters that I was getting, I kept getting letters saying, you know, I'm coming on my first elk hunt. I've never hunted elk before. I've hunted whitetail. And, I mean, we kind of busted on some of those people. You know, I give those Texas boys a hard time. <laughs> you know? and, uh, but a lot of them are whitetail hunters. But I'm telling you, uh, same thing for guys that have just hunted mule deer. Uh, there's turkey hunters out there that uh, want to come up and do some elk hunting. You know, if you're a hunter, you're a hunter. And you just love being out there and getting the experience. So a lot of these things apply that way. The only thing I would say is a lot of times, mule deer hunters and whitetail hunters there's going to be a little bit difference in elevation so that kind of comes into play turkey hunters man turkeys are all over the doggone globe here so it can vary from state to state to state that's right you know uh i think the first thing to remember joe is you know elk are going to let you know where they're at you know they're vocal yeah yeah you know they're social animals um, yep. They have a distinct smell, and they're huge and easier to spot. And uh, can you, real hard to say that about whitetails. Yeah, that's why you know when when people start thinking about the fact that they've never elk hunted, and they're worried about how hard it is to make that jump. I'm tell you what, I think it'd be harder for me to make the jump from as an elk hunter going to hunt whitetail or going to hunt any deer because they're not vocal, they're not big. I can't, I can't track them down with my nose. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you had a little bit of that here a few months back when you came down there hog hunting, you know, yeah. it's just different. It's not, it's not like hunting elk. Those suckers are smart. You know, they use their nose tremendously well. Um, they adapt to that harsh, harsh terrain and they love the thicker, the better. And, uh, so it, it, no doubt, I mean, it's hard. It was, 
I'm not going to lie. It was hard on me as a white tail hunter to make that tra- transition, but it was more on the physical and mental side. Sure. Than it was exactly. Yeah, absolutely. You think about that, man. You think about, I mean, <laughs> you're out there and you're walking through the woods and all of a sudden you hear, <laughs> and I mean, oh, Lord, and, and it's like, well, I know what that is now. Right. Yeah. You know, <laughs> well, I, I could go down there into the, whitetail woods man and i can walk around for days and not see one of those critters and not know and that's why i'm telling people when you think that making that jump one of the one of the main things that you think about we're going to talk about here in a little bit is is man i don't know if i could find one of those critters i don't know enough about them and just let me tell you they let you know where they're at that's it they give yourselves away in that time of year for sure i'm a carolina boy i came out here with zero skill sets for for uh, elk and the one thing I did ha- have was this big Italian nose, and uh, and I, I'm a pretty stealthy hunter, and I'm good in the woods, and I used that skill set to actually get my first elk and never spoke a word to it. So, you know, I, I just want you guys to make sure that you understand that. And here's what I find, Gilbert, is that when – and it's just not whitetail hunters. I mean, we're getting this in all these letters, first time hunters, or even second or third time elk hunters <clears throat> that haven't had a real good experience. They still don't have a lot of knowledge because you think about it, how many days they get to hunt and experience elk out here. You know, <laughs> me and Chad, we get to go out in those elk woods anytime we want. Right. But for most people, you know, if I spend 15 days, out in in the woods one year some people that's three, three. years or Easy. two years of hunting just to yes. get that experience yes. so a lot of people that we're getting questions from right now is exactly what you were telling me that we should talk about yeah. right uh-huh now uh you mentioned scent you know uh it works both ways and uh would you explain to the whitetail hunters what you mean by use your nose oh yeah 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 so what what i'm saying is is all of us as as hunters and whitetail hunters, mule deer hunters, we totally understand the idea of, of wind. I mean, you get out in those woods and you let a whitetail smell you, they're gone. I mean, I've never seen people be so, uh, I don't know if anal is a word or, or oh, what it is. but That's a great word, for yeah. sure. <laughs> but I mean, wearing rubber boots and doing all this stuff to ensure that they don't leave any kind of scent in the grass. And I've even had guys that have asked questions about elk, you know, will that turn them around? I've never had that kind of experience like what whitetail do. So you have that way of scent. But what I'm talking about is, is those animals have a distinct musky, uh, almost kind of licorice type smell like odor that you can smell at a long distance, you know, kind of like people smell cattle. I yeah, we, you know, us life. Texas boys, we raised around cows all our lives. And I guarantee you get out in a cow field, you're going to know the cows have been there. You're going to smell where yep. they've urinated or where they've defecated. And I mean, there's, there's a, you, I mean, if you've ever been on in a pasture with cattle, you know that they're <clears> there before you ever get to them. So my I mean, first technique, dude, my first technique was walking crosswind through mm-hmm. ridges mm-hmm. because you had those thermals going up and down, catching. Yeah the scent of those scent. elk oh, mm-hmm. and then turn it into the wind and hunting those boogers. So, uh, that, that's how I did that. So again, the biggest question that all you guys have out there is where do I start? Right. But here's the problem with that is that when you go, where do I start? You're taking a whole bunch of different parts of a hunt and you're just throwing it into a barrel and basically stressing yourself out that you don't have all this information well what i'm gonna do right now is i'm gonna simplify things for you and i'm gonna break this process down into separate tasks and we're going to handle them one by one and i want you to see something here so you say where do i start well number one you already have the weapon that applies you might have to do some tweaks to that weapon but all of you have a weapon that you hunt with whether it's a bow now if you haven't don't have a big game rifle you, know, you can always find out, but you shoot. So you understand and you're a good shot. It just takes getting the right caliber. So that's not a big deal. You have gear that works. I, you know, Chav said in one of our podcasts, you know, he talked about when we talked about the one most important piece of equipment and he said he had to have his bow because 
you know, it, he could go out in his shorts and shirt, and as long as he got in the shadows and stayed downwind, he could still get on an animal. So you guys have the gear if you're already hunting. You've got camo, you got packs, you got shoes. You know, there might be a few additions that you got to do, but guys and gals, we can give you a list for that. That's so, right. You know, yeah, we can tweak the things that you need that are important ex from, exactly, from your weapon. Standpoint. Exactly. The other thing is you already know your physical limitations. So all you have to do is stay within yourself. And when you are looking at where you're going to hunt, understand that out here in the West, not everything goes from 1,000 feet to 3,000 feet. Yeah. I mean, there are some areas that do that that right. are real mm -hmm. vertical that you got to go up and down, but there's a lot of places that aren't. There's a lot of places that slope. You get out to where those junipers mean those sage hills. That's totally different type. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole lot more gradual in those areas. So just because, you know, and you might be in dynamite shape. You might be the one that's going to go on that, on that backcountry backpack and you're going to hoof mm -hmm. it in, you're going to hoof it out and you're going to carry an elk out, out on your back. Well, right. you know, cool. But if you're not that, person there's options for you so that's nothing to really stress right. about all right you Joe, already I, i'd like to circle back to one thing when we uh -huh. started was the, you already have the weapon that applies and just tweak it right uh, i brought my weapon that applied to me my first elk hunt and look i'm very proficient with it i shoot it very well but one of the things i didn't do and i, I brought a cut on contact broadhead but i tell you that I, I hunted with carbon arrows and i'm gonna tell you for me shooting a heavier era has been god sent for me because i shoot a very fast bow by matthews and it made it to where i could tune my arrows at distance and uh I, 20 to 40 yards not a problem but when i'm shooting past that it made a big difference to me to go to a, a heavier a arrow like a full metal jacket or something and, and made just a big difference right yeah. full metal jacket cut on contact broadhead of your choice and stay away from the mechanicals was a big deal for me to get away from what i was hunting with at whitetail country right? and bro I, I want you to hold on to that thought too because we, when we get down to talk about setups i want you to go yeah. right with that okay uh, and and we're going to hit that puppy okay Perfect. so uh exactly what you're saying and that's what we're talking about the tweaks and we're going to hit that down just a, a little Perfect. bit when we get down there so uh we've said you know what your weapon is you know you have the gear you know that you what your physical limitations are you know what critter you're going to hunt so you know what to study on there and you know how to hunt you already have skill sets now we're going to talk here in a few minutes about the skill sets that you're going to want to hold on to and some of them that you're going to want to let go a little bit. Right. So, but you have skill sets. And like I said, I came out here not speaking a word in uh, 1981, 82 and, uh, and, and was able to get my first animal. So you can do that. Yeah. All right. So saying what we have as far as all of those tasks that you guys have a lot of, so what are the unknowns then? What are the things that the biggest stress is when you talk about where to start? Well, first of all is when do I hunt? And mm -hmm. that's not going to be all that hardy as well because depending on your weapon of choice and what state you're in, they're going to guide when you're going to hunt. Now, right you might have to decide between uh, three weeks or something like that with a block of five days or something. But mm -hmm. basically that's an easy because it's going to be pretty much determined. And I will tell you this too. Um, I'll just tell you, a lot of people say certain weeks are better and certain things, certain times are better, but man, uh, you can kill these animals in any of these weeks. Okay. So that's one of the unknowns. There's two more, okay? How to hunt, the techniques and strategies that you use for that. Well, that's why you're listening to shows like this. You can go online. You can use that computer. You can use all that content. So we can continue to work on that because you're right. That is something that you got to learn. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. But the biggest one for most people is where to hunt, yeah. okay? And uh, – I had the opportunity to be on the Where to Hunt uh, podcast 
last night. It was uh, awesome. With, with Eric Clark and, and this really got the juices flowing for this. And we talked about a lot of this and what I try to tell people is, is that if you're a first time hunter, simplify that for the first time. And you're like, Holy crap. How do I, I mean, the West is a vast place, right? Well, that's the problem. Don't look at it as a vast place because, um, a lot of that's going to be set for you. And here's what I said on last night's podcast was I tell people, if you want to do it like uh, um, Born and Raised did, get yourself a dart, chuck it on, <laughs> pick those states and chuck it and pick yourself a state. Or, you know, if you've heard something, you've read it in a magazine, a place that you'd like to experience, say, okay, that is where I want to hunt. And then you're going to apply for, those hunts in that state for their lottery. The other thing that you're going to do, you always have a plan B is where I'm going to hunt. In other words, if I don't draw where I want to, where am I going to go if I don't get that? Okay. And what I tell people is, is that one of the highest population of elk in the West for opportunity for you to have those uh, interactions with elk, to have those opportunities is Colorado. And Colorado Amen. is one of those states that has an over the counter tag. Yep. Okay. So listen to what I've said, put in for where you want to go. If you don't get that, know where you're going to go. And now when you look at over the counter, you have just eliminated a whole bunch of those units and it's going to make things a little more simple for you. Okay. Yep. Uh, so now that you've got that, now you can kind of make some choices in those simple areas there that correspond with your dates. And I tell you, I, <laughs> I said I might get called on this because you know, I said I, I think anybody could go in in any of those areas and have an encounter. Uh, there's, I, just, there's elk there, I guarantee you. Yeah. You know, I mean, Colorado's got more elk in it in the country. So, I mean. That's right. Uh, you right. know, you pick a good area and they got some over-the-counter tags go in there and do your little, I mean, it's, you know, you set all this out, but I mean, you do your pre-scouting, use your Onyx and use Google maps and yep. figure out, you know, where your water's at and figure, you know, the, you'll hear me say this a thousand times. These animals are slaves to their bellies uh, and they're going to have to be around cows if you want to kill a bull. Yeah. So uh, you so, guys believe in your skill sets, man, that's right. because you already do that. If you're a deer hunter, yep. even if you're a turkey hunter, I don't yeah. care if you're a squirrel hunter, man. You're right. already determining where the best areas are because of certain things. You're, you're looking for food. You're looking for water. You're looking for cover. And you're looking for those transition areas where they go from one to the other. So you already have a skill set that you can use. And I will tell you this. When you are doing your scouting, don't think about finding bull elk, especially if you're a bow hunter. You know, don't think about finding bull elk. Now, if you're a late season rifle hunter, different story. Right. But if you're hunting with that bow, <clears throat> you're not thinking about where you find the bulls. You want to think about where am I going to find the cows? Yep. Okay. And they need food. They need water. They need cover. And uh, those bulls are going to find those cows. So you, you do that. You're in the money. So you're already kind of simplifying things. And you're like, Joe, man, I'm living in freaking Arkansas. How do I know where the the, <laughs> the cows are in uh, Colorado and, and one of those units? I'm going to go to unit 26. I don't even know if there is a unit 26, but I'm just throwing that out there. Right. And I'm going to go to unit 26 and I'm on there and, you know, how do I, how do I do that? Well, first of all, don't go on a forum and ask people where the best place is to hunt in that unit. Um, you get all kinds of answers and oh, yeah. you yeah. might even get some people kind of ornery, but uh, they, they want you to do your homework. They want you to earn it. And I tell you, when people see you earning it, doing your homework, then they start to help you out a little bit. So get on your computer, use an app like go hunt. I brought that up last night as well. We Great have app. never used it. I've never used it. I've looked at mm -hmm. it. I've looked at it and it's tremendous with the content it gives you. Yep. to help you scout. So you got Go Hunt, you got Google Earth, and you have Onyx. And 
you know, those alone are going to help you look at an area, zoom in, and man, Onyx. Amazing. I, yeah, it's, it's it, because the type of areas that you're looking for when you're doing things <clears throat> like that is, is think about where was it that we got our bulls last year, Chow? Yeah, the, the, well, we had a fresh fire. Mm -hmm. We had a fresh burn, and that was uh, that came out pretty good on Onyx. We could find it pretty easy. <laughs> sure did, yeah. And not only that burn, but you go into Onyx, it gives the year. It gives yeah. all the older burns, what year they were. <clears throat> and <clears throat> any time you have a change in the canopy, you have growth that comes out of the ground, and that mm -hmm. growth is great food for those animals. Nutritious, yep. Yep. Yeah, and, and they're going to come to it. So you look for things like burns. You look for things like logging areas. You look for things like transitions. And transitions are, you know, changes from aspens to pine, from pines to scrub oak, uh, mm -hmm. from juniper to sage. You know, those kinds of areas are parks. transitions. Yeah, yeah. Parks. Mm -hmm. parks. Parks with water, parks with wallows. Yeah. You know, the first time you ever heard the word park, did you know what it meant? Um, I don't believe so. When I heard it from up there, up there in the West, no, I thought it was a place where there's a playground, you know, yeah, right. and I'm like, a park. <laughs> and so it's, you know, here we call them fields, you know, or fields meadows. Or meadows. Yeah. Right, was, but yeah. they call them parks up there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing when you're doing your scouting, make sure that when you're doing your scouting, you're looking at it both in satellite, but look at it with satellite hybrid with the topo lines. Because mm -hmm. what you're looking for is you're it looking changed. for areas where those animals can go from those thick northern, northeastern bedding areas, and they can go down into parks, meadows, open areas, scrub oak, to where they can feed and be safe in the evenings and then head back up. In, in the mornings. So kind of we're going to do a whole thing on doing e-scouting like that. So uh, you guys uh, stay tuned for that. Um, that's going to be happening. We're going to talk more about it. But I'm just trying to tell you that even from Arkansas, with the tools we have today, you can get a huge jump. I mean, way bigger jump than I had when I came to the state in 1980 trying to figure out what a topo map was looking at and correspond. I mean, you have SEAL team satellite imagery now, man. Right. You know, it, mm -hmm. it's unbelievable. So the other thing is on the where to hunt, whatever you do, just don't lock everything into one place, have multiple plans. And if you haven't heard us before, we like to have a plan A, B, C, and D. And if something's not working one place, we get our butt up and we go to another. Okay. Yeah, and if some of our listeners uh, want to have us, you know, uh, recommend a place for them to hunt, we'd be glad to do that offline with them and have a discussion with them via email. So, again, guys, y'all send us your questions at info at elkbros.com. Be glad to lead you in the right direction or, you know, whatever, whatever you guys got going on, this is how we uh, <laughs> keep our show going. So, as a disclaimer, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I – I'm always real careful about <clears throat> telling somebody this is the spot to go unless I've been there. But, yeah. you know, I, I, if, if you do get some help, you know, come and say, God dang, those guys led me the wrong way because <laughs> I, I can tell you what uh, I've gone scouting for all of us where, when we're going to hunt and yep. we've checked it out and man, we were locked into this spot, had scouted it two weeks earlier, got into it and it was church mouse quiet. Yep. And, you know, it's just anything could have happened. We don't know. Where did they go, Joe? Yeah. And we, and we don't know. They, Mountain we might lines have could have come through. I mean, you yeah. don't know. You don't yeah. know what could have happened. Right? We have no clue. I mean, they could have come in and moved cattle out of that area. It could have been all kinds of things that happened there. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's elk Hunt. hunting. It's, it's elk. hunting, man. <laughs> elk are where they're at. Elk are where yeah. you find, find them. And a week back. later, they can all be back in there. So. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, it, it only takes them right a matter of minutes to get from five miles. They can cover some that. ground like no animal I've ever seen before. Nothing is impossible for them. No, 
and no they terrain, have, no nothing, no weather, nothing. That's it's amazing. exactly right. Yeah. Only thing that really is is tough on them are the apex predators, right? Sure. Your outlines, your bears, the wolves in the places that in Yellowstone and stuff. I mean, luckily where we hunt, we don't have many wolves. Coyotes, I guess, can be tough on the on the calves, but um, you know that's why you guys need to get out there and kill coyotes and mountain lions and whatever states that'll let you varmint hunt. Uh, and then you know Joe talked about it with uh, with uh, Mr. Batiste, I think, about bear hunting, right? Yeah, Controlling well, it was Trent. Trent was yeah. talking about that's in right. Oregon, right? Yeah, Trent. Mm-hmm. Uh, Trent Fisher from Trent Born Fisher and Raised. From Born and Raised. Yeah, that's uh-huh. right. Uh, they were talking about how bears kill a lot of calves you know so i mean got to do our job and helping our elk herds out that's right uh we had um i I know of a large ranch that uh, had a really really bad year weather wise and moisture and so they had a lot of calf mortality and then they had another year where they actually had really really good water great growth but that year they chose not to have any bear hunting on it and mm. they actually had higher calf mortality I bet. just because of that so that's a good point so yeah. what we did there is we just told you that all of those problems on where do i start is you know let's deal with some of those little more difficult ones because a lot of those just really aren't as much as you think they are okay so don't go stressing out on we're going to talk about that mentality a little bit but <laughs> lots of help for you here yeah. And so you're a deer hunter. What skill sets do you bring from deer hunting? You know, when I first started elk hunting, that was a big deal for me, Joe, was to to actually have a real elk hunt out in the West. You know, I didn't want some canned hunt and I didn't want to hunt, you know, uh, in Texas, we got elk, you know, we can go hunt them in a high fence here. Uh, I didn't want to do that. I uh, know I could have, but I wanted a real elk hunt. So uh, when I got out there, uh, the things that I brought with me were, number one, from being a deer hunter, we're we're taught to shoot at a real small target. Uh, mm-hmm. Whitetails aren't that big here in Texas. Um, I, they get up to a couple hundred pounds, uh, about like the size of an average mule deer in, in y'all's uh, neck of the woods there. Our mule deer get a little bit bigger <clears throat> out in the sand hills and the Big Bend area. Uh, they get bigger, you know, 250, 300 pounds. But um, for us, shooting was so important. So we do a lot of shooting, you know. We do a lot of shooting at at a smaller game all year, hogs and everything else. If I can hunt it with a bow, I guarantee you I'm doing it, right? I'm just that that tore up about bow hunting. So the the shooting part was not – difficult for me other than I don't shoot straight up and straight down. Right. 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 Uh, right. When you're in the mountains, you'll have an opportunity to make a shot uphill and you'll have an opportunity to make a shot downhill. Right. Uh, And I've had to do both. And both times, uh, you know, one time I was not very successful and uh, I did hit the animal. Uh, It was just a glancing blow, but I shot straight down. And I used, it was 31 yards. I used my 30 yard pin and I shot right over his back, just skipped it off his back. So when I got back to elk camp, you know, my anal self, I decided, well, I, you know, heck right behind camps, a 40 foot drop, you know, I'm going to go back there and stand up and shoot. And I could have shot 40 yards with my 20 yard pin shooting straight down. So, Mm -hmm. and kill that, kill that animal stone dead. So, um, and the same thing shooting up, it's a little bit different. So I would urge you when you get there, uh, shoot your bow, right? Uh, because it's not going to be the same as where your altitude's a little bit different. So we dial everything in when we get to camp, uh, white tail hunters are, are, you know, pretty well set here in Texas. If your bow shot good in Houston, it's probably going to shoot pretty good in San Antonio or out West or wherever. But when you get to the mountains, the air's different, the altitude's different, the barometric pressure's different, everything's different. So you need to shoot your bow in camp. Exactly, uh, yeah. And then another thing that we brought with us was the ability to be scentless, right? We, uh, these elk, these deer down here in Texas and everywhere you hunt a white-tailed deer, if you're not playing the wind, you're going to lose. And being scent-free is huge, right? 
We've worked with those, the Ozonics down here. It works fantastic, uh, but you can't just really strap that to your back and go walk through the elk woods, right? I mean, I guess you could, but I ain't done it yet. <laughs> they ain't so, figured it out yet, right? Yeah, but it's coming. Right. It's coming, I'm sure. But uh, at, at the end of the day, it was about having our clothing scent free, Joe, using the wind. Uh, and then, you know, we call we call whitetails. We, we use our horn rattling uh, and stuff like that here, and we use a little grunt call where we – where we vocalize a, a, a grunt, a tending grunt, or an estrus grunt, and, and does bleat here too. So they'll have an estrus bleat that they bleat. So we have a little, you know, a little call that we use for that. But that's the only time that they're a little more vocal is during the rut. And you'll very rarely hear a whitetail grunt. If you're close enough bow hunting, you'll hear it a little bit, right? Right. Uh, but very rarely do they give up their position like a bull elk. So. Uh, I think one of the things that we're really accustomed doing more than anything in Texas is we're stand hunters, right? Mm -hmm. So we right. Aren't, aren't on our feet, right? right. So um, we get up in the stand and we wait for the corn feeder to go off and uh, the whole world comes alive. And if you're lucky enough, you're hunting a, a, a funnel between a bedding area and a feeding area and, uh, you know, or hunting a, a creek bottom or whatever where there's mast and food source. Uh, so they come to you. And you're kind of ambushing them. Well, there's no doubt that you can do that elk hunting. And we've done it. If we've seen them, we could go get on them. But it is so much more uh, physically driven than whitetail hunting in Texas. Right? Well, and uh, the point that I really want to drive home is that if you're a good deer hunter, you can be a good elk hunter. I don't always think that... Uh, <laughs> And, and take this in the right way, all you guys out there. I don't think that necessarily a, a good elk hunter is always a good deer hunter because we move differently. We sound differently. You know, it's, uh, you know, hunting deer is a whole different pace. And, you know, Chav, we hunted deer for years and, and you hunted deer way before you hunted elk. What do you think you brought from that skill set that helped you with elk hunting? Well, again, uh, you know, when we, when we first started, I uh, had younger eyes. <laughs> That's the one thing I noticed about <laughs> Gilbert and uh, Manano is they were able to spot the elk pretty quick, you know. I guess because they're, look, they're looking for smaller animals when they're hunting whitetails. Good so point. They brought, they brought that over to the, the elk hunt because uh, I, I know Gilbert was the first one to spot animals on several occasions. And I know when, uh Luis? Yeah, Luis. The first time he took Luis out, he said, there's a bull over there. And we're like, what? <laughs> right. You know, no, so, absolutely. Yeah. So I think that's one thing. Uh, you know, as I've gotten older, I know my eyes aren't as good. But I think that was that was a big thing. Yeah. You know, uh, we were always looking for vertical uh, or straight lines. And uh, I, well, think, I think that, that, you know, because because of the nature of the deer hunting and having not having them sound off and they are so silent and having to really search out every small speck in the woods. Yeah. You bring a good point. Yeah. I think the deer hunters. And you so look much. at the shadows a lot, yeah. a lot closer than you normally would, I guess. Right. Right. Yeah. I remember one morning Joe and I were on a hunt and we actually walked into the middle of a herd. Of, <laughs> I mean, seriously <laughs> walked right in the middle of a herd of elk and it was real low light. Like, and I'm, I'll be honest with you guys, my eyes are starting to, you know, in low light conditions, they're not near <clears throat> what they used to be 10 sure. years ago. And I remember looking. Welcome, welcome, the, welcome to AARP, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I remember looking into those woods and I saw something move and I, I looked at Joe and Joe's just kind of humping, you know, and I looked again and I'm like, oh, dang man. So I grabbed his backpack and jerked on it. And he stopped. I said, Joe, I believe that's an elk over there. He digs in his pack and everything. You know, he looks at her and gets his binoculars and he looks and he goes, It is elk over there. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, we're right. I mean, right in the middle right of the herd. Right on him. And you know, <laughs> you, you brought up something that kind of contradicts me a, a, at times. And <clears throat> and I tell guys if it if you have to choose between a rangefinder, if you know, if that's important to what you need in your shooting and binos, it's range finder for sure. Because mm -hmm. out there, you know, if you, you can leave the binos home and you can get away with it perfectly. But mm -hmm. you brought up a good point in early morning, low light, you know, when you're trying to 
you can actually check out areas and parks and stuff as you're moving in that you wouldn't see things because uh, if you get you have some binos that pull in a little bit of light, it helps you out. So that was a good point there. So I, I think it's going to be easier on this next thing about what to forget from deer hunting. Mm -hmm. the, what you know the things that that I see guys all the time. Like when I start taking off after an animal, when I hear it, they're they're like, "What the heck are you doing?" You know? Yeah, there's you know, no, no doubt. The noise I mean, level, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're so set on being stealthy and quiet. But right. Look, man, elk make a lot of racket. I mean, it's like I heard a herd of buffalo coming through the woods. So um, we're At not the same so. Time they can sound. I mean, they can make no sound and sneak no off. No doubt. On you. No doubt. And you can't. Exactly. And they can pull their horns. I've I've seen bulls come down a big black timber ridge and never touch anything with them giant amazing. antlers. I, I can't do that in my own hallway. I know it. It's amazing, <laughs> man. I, I've, I've seen it. I've, you know, just about seen it all down through right. there. And But the thing is, is so you say, you know, what to forget. Right. So, yep. Yeah, I mean, not necessarily, uh, you know, if your guide's stopping and he's trying to, 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 to pinpoint where those elk are, that's not the time to make a bunch of racket because right, he's right. trying to listen and stuff like that. But as you're going, you know, if you crack a stick or something, like give a little cow call. I mean, they're always cracking sticks or kicking rocks or mm -hmm. whatever. So I think, I think you can make a little bit more noise <clears throat> as you're advancing your position. But one of the big things I want everybody to learn from this, and it was one of the toughest things for me to learn. And I'm sure Joe's going to go, amen, brother, is get – away from shooting that animal in the shoulder <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. white tail hunters want to <clears throat> shoot a deer in the shoulder or right behind the shoulder guys i'm gonna tell you something if you shoot an elk in the shoulder you're gonna be in, you're gonna be disappointed um they have a plate in that shoulder that's almost impenetrable i shoot a hammer of a bow and so does joe and so does our Venezuelan mafia brothers. And I'm telling you, I've hit them in that top part of that shoulder. We're just below the hump and you're going to get about three inches of penetration and your heart broke because you could have shot him about four inches, five inches to the right and three inches lower and you'd have smoked him. Right. Right. So, but those inches make a big difference. Really, really study the anatomy of an elk and understand from the crease, you've got a foot back at least to send that arrow through there. It's all about angles. It's really about your exit and not your entrance. Uh, and forget about being near that shoulder, guys. Yeah, you, uh -huh. can, you can go back four or five inches from that crease and you're going to be just fine, man. And, and, and it gives you a little bit of room on each side and up down. So yep. uh, just remember the goal of that is, is that you're going, to, you're going to get two holes. And another thing you need to forget from deer hunting <laughs> is uh, you, you need to forget about mechanical heads, you know, uh, that you need to do away with. You well, have I know to, we're not going to get any love from the, mus from, the <laughs> from the hypodermic people and stuff like that, but at the end of the day, I've just, I've been on many elk hunts, and I know you have too, Joe, where it's just, man, you just don't get the penetration you need or a double, you know, a, or a pass-through. And the thing, the whole thing is, yeah, you know, the whole thing about love for anybody is that this is all about, as far as I'm concerned, doing, you know, making a responsible clean kill. And if, if that ruffles some feathers because, uh, uh, you know, so well, it's our opinion, you yep. know, it's our opinion. And, it's what we've done. And yep. those are our opinions and you don't have to agree with them, but if you're going to put all that time and money <clears throat> and effort into an elk hunt, <clears throat> why not start? I mean, you can, you could drive a Pinto up there, but if you could drive an F-250, you'd probably be a heck of a lot more comfortable. And all y'all right. can ask my wife. I've been wrong before, but I tell yeah. you what, I, yes, I have, baby. Yes, I've, been, baby. I've been on a lot of animals. I've seen a lot of hits in 37 yeah. years, and, and that's the conclusion that I've come to is if you want better insurance, because there are still so many variables They're so that can tough. happen out there, but if you want to do the things that are most going to help you. So yeah, you, you're not going to worry about sound like you do uh, with when you're deer hunting, you're definitely going to move way faster, man. I mean, 
way faster. I've run up on elk, man. I mean, yeah. I've run up to them, and because I've done that, they thought I was a bull coming at them and right. come into me. So, like Gilbert said, when you're making elk noises like them, it's those human noises, like an arrow tapping something or, you know, zippers going up and down. It's those types of things that kind of freak them out a little bit. So, you know, there's some things that you skill set you get to bring, some that you need to forget when you're doing that. I want to I want to reiterate, man, guys, get away from that shoulder. As yeah. whitetail hunters, I can tell you the three times I shot at an elk before I ever killed one, I focused on that elk shoulder, and that is not where you want to be. Yeah. I started. I didn't start shoot. I didn't shoot elk anymore. I started killing elk as soon as I picked a spot away from that to drive it through his vitals and understand where it's going to exit. Understand right. the body language of that elk. Understand how he's standing what type of angle I have. And, and look, guys, a lot of that is going to be foreign to you because we pick a spot on a whitetail and we just cut it loose because it don't matter. We're going to blow through both shoulders. You know, we're going to blow through rib cage. I mean, it's not going to matter. He's real thin skin. Well, that's, that ain't the way these big You hit that are. shoulder on this bull, he is going to – he's going to freak just for a second. He's going to stop, and he might even bugle – at you after that and he can go start rounding up cows again oh man. yeah he has just a flesh wound yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so i want to make some suggestions now uh did you have something else there gilbert I'm sorry, yeah gilbert. i was gonna say a real good friend of mine killed a five by five or shot a five by five in an area that we were hunting and i we didn't recover him he shot him high in the hump and i know it was scotty's broadhead because i know what broadhead scotty shoots and uh the next year, I had a real good friend of mine in the same area kill a big five by five. And as we were skinning him, uh, Scotty, and it looked, this is a cut on contact broadhead. He just shot him too high in the shoulder. And uh, we were skinning him out. And lo and behold, there's Scotty's broadhead. And Scotty has a memento of that, of uh, knowing not to shoot in that area of the shoulder. <laughs> what I wanted to do now is I wanted to make some suggestions. We, we talked about. Uh, some of those questions that y'all have. And, and I tried to, basically, the whole underlying theme of what I was just telling you is, is you can do this. It is not something that is as foreign to you as you think, as you think it is. And, you know, you didn't come out of mama knowing how to hunt whitetail or muleys either. So it was a learning process. And you do this, it is going to be a life-changing experience for you. Trust me and believe in that. Okay, so a couple suggestions. Number one I would have is make sure if you're going to come out elk hunting, have a hunting buddy, you know, Amen. Um, yeah. for a number of reasons. Safety, but number one. Safety is one. Um, somebody to share the experience with. Uh, somebody that's going to help you, go, you know, when you guys are preparing, going to motivate each other. Uh, getting animals out of the mountains because you guys are going to be successful. So that help is, is critical there. And it's just an overall much better experience when you get to share that and enjoy that. And, and I know some people love the intrinsic value of being alone and, and that's just their style. That's what they love to do. And maybe I'm saying this because for me, uh, I've had opportunities to hunt by myself and, and I've actually said no because I would rather go and share the memories with other people because to me, it's all about the adventure. It's about the memories and, and sharing those. So uh, I urge you to get a hunting buddy. Uh, another thing is, Gilbert, now you can talk about your set up there. Yeah, you want to simplify it, guys. <clears throat> I mean, it's a little bit different. You want to set up for something that's a, it's a really big animal. It's four times the size of a white of a white tailed deer, right? I mean, you're you're essentially out there hunting a Clydesdale horse with horns, right? I mean, they're humongous, huge critters, and uh, you've got to have the right setup. So I'm not telling you you got to shoot 70 pounds because you don't. I think you could kill them all day long with 55 to 60, but you better shoot an arrow that's, you know, heavy. I shoot a double uh, – I shoot a uh, full metal jacket arrow. Uh, I shoot a 31-inch draw bow, so you guys can figure that out with the KE – 
I shoot 100 to 125 grain broadhead, depending on which one I'm going to shoot. But it is a cut on contact broadhead. It is not a mechanical. It's not a hybrid either. I shoot a cut on contact. Uh, I recommend three types of heads. I recommend Muzzy Trocar. I make a, recommend the T-Lock sh Shuttle T, and I recommend the Bloodsport Wraith. Um, I, those are the and, – and the Wasp, too, the one that uh, Joe shoots. It's a big uh, punch-cut broadhead that looks a lot like a Muzzy. But those – we have so much success with those heads and that arrow. I know Joe, Joe hunts with carbon arrows. Uh, he hunts with a very heavy carbon arrow, and uh, he made that switch – a few years back from, <laughs> from a double X 75s, uh, we got him on the carbon blend and, uh, it's, uh, it's changed his hunting too, you know, so, uh, tighter groups, better, you know, better recovery. A lot of times. Well, I, and arrows. I think the main thing was I had, uh, I'm instinctive for those people who don't know it. And, uh, what I found is, is what I looked at before as being 40, you know, I could now shoot at 50. So I was shooting a lot flatter uh, with those arrows like that. So it, it kind of, it kind of bummed me out a little bit that I had to start. <laughs> <laughs> he had to spend some more money. I told him though, as long as he's, as he's shooting them, he'll have somebody that can buy his bullets for him. <laughs> hey, uh, another thing guys is one of the big things that confused me quickly was my pen, my pens. Right, I shoot That's a six what we were pin. talking about with you, right, Chad? Yeah. Yeah. I shoot a six-pin setup because I shoot all the way out to 80 yards. Uh, I will tell you, you need to spend a lot of time understanding the colors and, and which pins you're going to use. It happens really fast. You need to use your range finder and identify things in front of you, and then you got to know which pin you're going to use if you're going to shoot a multi-pin. Some guys come and they simpl they simplify it and they use a one pin sight and they dial it up. I mean that's fine. I, I imagine that's a lot easier for me. It's been easier to understand and just work extremely hard on understand how far the bull is and what pin I'm going to use. And, and I I like to tell people too, man, that there's nothing that you can't shoot with a three pin setup too. Agreed. And. Agreed. Uh, uh, the only thing, the thing I like about it again is the more that you can simplify what yep. you have in your sight picture, the better. And, and I did that, Joe, my third year. I only yep. shot three pins. I shot, yep. I shot one to 30, one to 40, and one to 50. And uh, for me, it worked real well. I wanted to shoot out past 40 yards. So I started messing with a spot hog six pin sight and uh, and then learned how to gap shoot after that. So, I mean, we shoot in camp, we shoot out to a hundred. But yards. you know, you know, Gilbert, you, you think about, you know, you've got some years of experience under no you. No and, doubt. uh, I mean, you think about that very first experience that we were talking about in the last podcast and, uh, you know, you had a bull at 17 yards. Use my 40 and, yard pen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, so. I can't tell y'all how to train for these intense moments when these bulls are screaming at you, bloody murder. I mean, they are, you will never in your life feel that feeling until you get them screaming at you at less than 20 yards. It is unnerving to have that animal standing over you because most of the time you're on your knees or even if you're standing up, they're so big. It's just you can't hardly duplicate it in your in your practice. I'll let my son sit outside and yell and scream and holler at me while I'm shooting <laughs> just to try and try and distract me because there's going to be a lot of stuff going on. There'll be other elk moving, and you got to really learn how to focus. You know, I, I took my daughter on an elk hunt. She killed a bull with a crossbow, and she hit a bull. And I noticed where she shot. He, he, he was dead. And, 35 seconds. So for me, that really clued me in on something in the area that I want to shoot bulls. Right. So I, I man, I anymore when it's go time and I turn the hat around backwards, um, <laughs> I, I focus on where I need it to go. And I don't care if it hair lips the governor, we're going to get it done. Now you shot, <laughs> you've shot pins for a lot of years, Chav. And, and what best pin setup did you like? I think the three pin setup for me, because uh, not as confusing when you have six because you got to be thinking uh, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, you know. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, most of my shots anyway were from uh, 30 in, so right. it wasn't a big problem. 
you know, and that's, that's one thing. I would I urge you guys to simplify for sure. Yeah. And I tell people, you know, if, if you make, if that's your effective range, 30 yards, you know, you don't even need that range finder cause you're going to pretty much know where that critter is, you know, each time. Mm -hmm. right. So, uh, you always shot within yourself and right now. Yeah. yeah. I probably passed up some shots I could have made, but, uh, because I, I wasn't aware of the distance, the exact distance, you know, I didn't attempt it. So no, the best shot like that is yeah. No shot. Yeah. Right. I think, I think that's one <clears throat> of the things too, guys is <clears throat> if you don't know how far that animal is, please don't try to shoot at it. Cause I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to guess it wrong. In the mountain countries, it's, there's so much backdrop and so much background. That animal could be inside of 30 yards, and you still think he's 40 or 50, or he could be 40 or 50, and there's no backdrop. He looks like he's right on you, right, because they're so big. So if you really don't know where he's at and don't know a yardage, I just – I would pass because sure. I'm telling you – there is nothing worse than watching a bull walk off with that arrow hanging out of him or you, you know, you wounding him or something like that. I just, man, I don't shoot a white tail. I don't know how far he is. I promise you, I don't. And I'm never going, just because that bull's four times bigger doesn't mean he's easier to shoot because it's not, it's harder to shoot than a white tail. I want to tell you guys too, that there are ways to help yourself with that whole distance thing too, because I have never carried a range finder uh, in my life. And, uh, but I do a lot of imprinting uh, to be able to, and, and you can actually go on to uh, uh, one of our sites and you can see things on imprinting. I think it's on our Patreon site that I just put that on. But, you know, the, the thing that I'm always doing too is when I'm walking around in the woods and, and I have slack time, I keep a, a judo with me and I'm constantly looking at something and, and in my head, I'm covering what that distance is, and I'm shooting that. Because you're right, Gilbert, out there with the trees, and, the, and you go from thick to open areas to different types of setups, and, and it can play with you as far as distance. But you can train yourself to be better at that by doing a lot of stump shooting and keeping that with you while you're out there. One thing we didn't cover as far as, um, you know, uh, your setup is we didn't talk to uh, – to the rifle hunters and for oh, those yeah. guys that are you know talking about that you know um there's not a whole lot that you need to change on things other than you really need to know if you're shooting off of sticks or if you're shooting off a bipod you really have to work at being able to get into position into what your most effective position is as soon as possible with that so that you can be accurate and most people will will hunt with a, a 308, a 300 wind mag. Um, my daughter kills a lot of elk with 270. So, um, well, a couple of elk with 270 anyway. She's a deadly shot. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's really important. And I know a, a good friend of mine that, you know, instead of going up in caliber, he was really good and very comfortable with what he was shooting. And so he just made sure he was shooting the shot that was the best shot at the best range where he was most effective and putting that animal down. So again, you know, a, a lot of those setups will work. You just got to really know your setup and you got to be comfortable with your gear on that. All right. Yeah, I, I think two, two really big things on rifle hunters, is number one, make dang sure you shoot your weapon when you get there. You uh, better. Because the altitude's going to be deal. totally different, right? Mm -hmm. Make sure you sight your weapon in and use really good, uh, high-quality bullets, Barnes, VLD, all, those two projectiles or, you know, some of the trophy copper stuff now that's come out from, uh, from Federal. But if you can shoot a Barnes, I don't care if it's any, any in any uh, – type of ammunition if you shoot a barnes bullet it's one of the best bullets that holds together best penetrating rounds that's the big thing is you want to get as much penetration i don't care if you're shooting a 243 a 270 a 30-06 if you can shoot a barnes bullet you're going to have a bullet that's going to perform and another thing towards preparing um is that there's this thing here in the west called altitude <laughs> that is the hidden <laughs> the hidden monster so it's always good to to work yourself to do some high intensity training. Um, if you don't know what that is, 
go online, <clears throat> look up HIT, HIT training. And a lot of it is just really hard, really fast type of training in all different ways, whether it's push-ups, whether it's leg squats, whether it's short sprints. But it's to get that heart rate up really, really quick and not give you but only so much recovery before you go on the next one. And what that will do is at least you're starting to train your body to recover a little faster because the altitude up here uh, is different for a lot of you guys. Um, you got to prepare. And, and we talked in la you know some of our other podcasts about aspirin regimens to help yourself uh, so that you don't come up here and have high altitude headaches and those types of things. So that's something to think about. And, and hydrate, man. It's so important for you to hydrate because you're going to lose a lot of hydration up there in the mountains. It's going to be cool. And whether you think it or not, I mean, my first elk hunt, I was 325, 330 pounds. I like to die going up and down those mountains. Carl Gamage pulling me up and down them. But I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm not that heavy anymore. I'm, you know, dang near 100 pounds less. Yep. So at the end of the day, I mean, I was not prepared. Uh, I thought I was, but I guarantee you I was uh, in uh, through many challenges and uh, everything, you know, I've worked on that part of it and worked on the physical, physical side. And that made me such a better hunter. Number one, being able to get there and being able to close the deal, real good recovery. Because when you get there, sometimes it's happening so fast, you don't have time to catch your breath. You know, for a lot of you guys out there that, um, you're doing a lot of vacationing in the summer. Oh, here, here's a, something that I'm going to put on you. From this point, if you're elk hunting this year, from this point till you get up in the mountains, wherever you stay in a hotel or well, wherever you stay in a hotel, you do not use the elevator. I don't care if you're on the third floor, eighth floor, or 13th floor. You do not use the elevator. Start using those steps. If you do that, you're going to get yourself ready. Um, just by doing that, getting go up and down uh, on those steps and getting your, your heart rate up, you know, working those legs because, you know, when you have to, when you're going down, it's not so bad. It's a little tough mm -hmm. on the knees. When you're going level, it's not so bad. But I tell you what, when you start going up those hills, and I'm not talking straight vertical stuff. It doesn't have no, to be that way. No, it don't much. have to be that way. No, when you, you – Hell, everywhere you, up there is uphill. <laughs> you, you, you combine a hill – with the altitude and, and you're going to feel it. So flat, flat with altitude, you're going to feel it. I'm going to tell you right now, brother, whew, I'll never forget it. Like somebody threw a car on my chest. I swear to God, we were on flat ground and it was like I was dying. You know, and Carl said, well, we're kind of going uphill. And I'm like, oh, both ways, we're coming back. I mean, this is horrible. And then, and, and you say something, Joe, it ain't, it ain't bad going down. Uh, I beg to differ. Chav and I spent yeah, two hours one down. time going down. I like to die. I mean, so much of that fallen timber. You're just not ready for it. You, you right, know, right. The boys from here, from Texas that are flatlanders, we got a little bit of hills and stuff like that. But we ain't ready for it. You know, our, <laughs> our legs and our ankles, you know, man, guys, invest in you some comfortable boots and really good socks. There's nothing better than changing socks and putting a really nice feeling pair of socks on when you've had a rough day in the elk woods. So where I'd like to end this whole thing at is what I think is the most important for all of y'all that are, that are asking that question of where do I start and those people that are uneasy and those people that sometimes um, create even more out of it and kind of stress themselves out, and that's your mindset. Look, do not come out here or on an elk hunt with what ifs or a defeatist attitude. Don't go into elk camp saying, well, uh, I probably won't get something. I might not get some, but I'm going to have a good experience. Well, you know, you're going to have a good experience coming out here and, and telling yourself, I'm going to get after it. I am going to be the hunter. I am going to go into this with a mindset of being successful because I'm prepared, because I'm confident, because I have a skill set and I'm a hunter. And because I am a hunter, those animals out there are in trouble. And, you know, you can do that. Come out full of adventure and confidence 
And the way you do that is looking at all these different parts and making sure that none of them are strange to you. Because if you are working on that shoot in that last week before you come out, there is no way you're going to be confident because little Freddie doubts going to be in your head there and it's going to deal with you, man. So, uh, don't worry and stress over the experience, live for the experience, come out and get the full snout full of that. Come out here and have those encounters with the animal, get one of them ripping and roaring close. And I, I tell you, I don't know what kind of shape you are when you come in here, but I guarantee you come out and you hunt elk for the first time. I guarantee you the next time you come, you're going to be in better shape uh, just oh, yeah. because it's going to change your life. It's going to do something for you that is unbelievable. It's just such a cool experience. So Yeah, and, and guys, when you come back, you're going to be even better deer hunter. Uh, I've just conquered – you know, one of the, arguably the toughest animal in North America to kill, if you ask me, especially with a bow. And you come down here to your whitetail country and it's like, it's like shooting fish in a barrel, you know. So. Chav, when we close out, what I'd like you to do is, uh, there's a story, you're always telling these little stories about, um, uh, it's not over till it's over. Uh, can you, can you remember one of those hunts? I mean, there's been a bunch of those and, and kind of give just a little synopsis, give us a little uh, story on that hunt. Well, you know, uh, there's been God, several times, <laughs> you know, we've packed up and, you know, we've uh, gotten ready to hit the road and we said, let's go out there one more time just for an hour or so, see what happens. And, uh, you know, one time we both killed an elk half an hour, I mean, half an hour about, uh, I'd say half a mile apart. Right. And it took us the rest of the day and a mile from the truck. <laughs> <laughs> and you know how prepared. many trips, you know how many trips that took, Ooh, but it's Lord. never over till it's over. You know, uh, you never know when you're going to encounter the elk. It only takes just one. And it's happened to us many, many times, you know, uh, last day hunt, uh, last afternoon hunt. Sure. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, you, you never know. You never know. It's it's quite an experience. You know, it's something you'll you'll always remember. But uh, yeah, it's, it's never over till it's over. It's all about that attitude, man. You can give up and you can say it's not going to happen, or you can just keep grinding it out, keep enjoying every day and every moment of experience that you have out there, and create your opportunities and make it happen. So I hope for those people that. Uh, tuned into this, those people that are either beginners, um, you guys that are trying to, thinking about going from deer hunting to elk hunting, uh, people that uh, are just trying to try it for the first time. I hope we've given you something that's going to help you and pump you up a little bit and make you understand that you can do this. And, you, you know, uh, the things I've done, it all started with a boy from the Carolinas going out into the elk wood. That's all it was. And well, I guarantee you, Joe, I'm pumped up and I'm ready to go right now. <laughs> uh, this show has been awesome. Uh, it's been fantastic. Uh, last week's show and this week's show. Guys, again, if y'all have any questions for us, please uh, send us an email at info at elkbros.com. For Joe and Chav in New Mexico, I'm Gilbert Ornelas. God bless all of you out there. Kiss your wives and wives kiss your husbands. Hug your babies. And keep your broad head sharp and your powder dry. And we'll see you next week right here on Blue Collar Elk Hunting. See you next week, y'all. Next week.